At the beginning of this year, I was asked um, as the human rights um, and indigenous issues spokesperson for the Green Party to um, participate in the women's vote to Gaza. And so now before I start that corridor, I want to right at this very minute pay tribute um, to the Palestinians living in Gaza, especially the women and children. Palestinian women and children living in Gaza. Um, they are the whole reason for uh, our effort to break the inhumane and illegal blockade um, of Gaza uh, by the Israeli government. The hardships that they face, have faced forever, but are facing today and will continue to face for a long time um, was the purpose of our flotilla uh, an all women's peace flotilla. I left on the leg from Messina, from Sicily, um, and travelled the nine days across the Mediterranean Sea on a small boat of 13 unarmed civilian women from around the world. <coughs> Previously to leaving Messina, um, our yacht had, had two other legs, um, originally from Barcelona, to a Jackiel and then a Jackiel to Messina. And so uh, all in all, I think um, maybe well over 25 to 30 women from around the world took place on all of the three leagues. On my particular league, there was 13 of us. Um, I want to spend some time talking about the incredible women um, who I got to spend that time with on this mission. Uh, their impact on my learning and enlightenment and on my heart. Um, strong at this very second. I don't think I have recovered from my trip in many senses. And I'm normally a lot more together than this. You're being a true human being by showing the true human face of womanhood and all this terrible stuff that's happening everywhere. And most women I know are just and horrified and say why. So thank you, Wahine. Kia ora. Yeah, 
Dr. Fazia is a physician from Malaysia. Um, Jeanette and Sandra are from um, Norway, Spain, and Chile, and they are philosophers <coughs> and other parliamentary representatives. Um, we had teachers, um, artists, playwrights, other representatives of parliament, women who have stood long and strong um, for peace, but particularly for justice, and we understand that there is no such thing one without the other. I, was, I, had a, I had nine days on the Mediterranean, basically, of um, global education on the state of the world. And it was the most, it was the wānanga, it was the most effective wānanga that I will probably ever get in my lifetime of a wahine perspective on what is happening in each of our countries and how it is connected and how we as women of the world um, are connected um, and what we are standing up for and what we are uh, fighting. And I, I cannot speak about this trip without acknowledging um, their leadership. And as we came together on the boat, just an incredible sense of care and duty towards each other. There was 13 of us and only eight beds. So we took turns sleeping. Um, I was privileged to do the night shift for every night. Um, the night watch it was an absolute privilege, and I thought, and I think that's probably fitting because my name is Marama. <laughs> um, and I, and I, the, the night watch was a special, special time. Uh, and we shared beds. We, nearly everybody, got debilitatingly sick of the first three days and no food was cooked because no one was wanting to eat. Um, we cared for each other in between vomiting and loved each other because we were sometimes scared of um, whether our little boat was going to capsize um, and feeling quite miserable um, with uh, some chronic seasickness. Um, I, on night watch, I had to wake the women up every hour to get them to sip some water because we were at risk of dehydration. I was very lucky to not get seasick. Um, we cooked for each other. We helped each other um, work out the funny little pump toilet on the boat. Um, we helped each other in our moments of um, homesickness. Uh, it was. Even though the campaign was about peace, the way that we were towards each other on the boat was the absolute model for how we need to treat each other as human beings with all of our difference, with all of our um, uh, different experiences, with all of our different skills. There is just a foundation of complete care and respect um, for what we were doing and for each other. And um, it's one that I'm very used to on the marae. It's one that I'm used to in a, a true kaupapa Māori context. Um, and it's one that I wasn't expecting that we could achieve so easily, being so different, so different, um, because we were um, wanting to achieve something on our mission. So on the on the Ninth morning. Oh, actually, on the, the eighth night, so it might have been the Wednesday night, we knew that by six o'clock the next morning we were aiming to be 100 metres offshore of Gaza. And historically, um, boats have been boarded between the 100 and 70 metre, a uh, 70 mile offshore mark by the Israelis. We knew that we would hit 100 miles at six o'clock on the Thursday morning. So the night before was sort of like we, we suspected that would be our last night together on the boat. <coughs> the night before I was on night watch, it was just me and um, the, we had a woman captain and two women sailors. And it was just me and um, Emma who was the, on night watch with me driving the boat. And just the two of us up there, very dark, very quiet, very beautiful. And then we heard um, 
like but saw nothing and then it, it felt like it was going around about and I was like we're out in the middle of the sea there's nothing out there and there's no light and we figured out it was a helicopter that we couldn't see but was right next to us it's just going around and around our boat and then at the same sort of time uh, quite a long way off um, to our uh, left we saw we saw two sort of red lights um, we thought it was one boat and then we realized it was two because they split apart and then they, they sort of came out of nowhere and were really fast and then they just sat they just sat and watched our boat sailing. We stayed on our course, we weren't going fast at all. That moment, I had fear. Because I felt like sending, sending, sending your people out of this was Israel in the middle of the night, in the dark, I felt more afraid then of anything big that could happen during the day. And um, I was gripped with a little bit of fear at that moment. The helicopter went, the boats all of a sudden disappeared. I think they just had a little bit of a reiki out to see what we were up to. And uh, the next day, yes, we reached the 100 mile mark at six o'clock in the morning, bang on. Uh, for the rest of that day, we kept sailing. We almost thought we were gonna make it. Um, we got to uh, uh, 70 miles off. 50, 60 and so on, and we were thinking, wow, we're going to make it. And we had the women and children of Gaza constantly sending us messages and photos, wanting, waiting for us on the beach, a big sign saying, welcome, women's boat to Gaza. And we had photos of the children of Gaza with gripping their medical certificates, um, showing uh, their conditions and the health access that they were being neglected from the evening. We were getting all of this and we were, we were so excited. We thought we might get there. We thought we might get there because the Israelis had never let a boat get this close, we thought. Um, at about 4 p.m., so we spent that day a little bit anxious and happy and we spent that day cooking, cleaning the boat, packing our gears, um, getting rid of all of our kitchen knives, throwing them overboard, because in the past um, that has been used as evidence of terrorism. Throwing our big heavy stainless steel uh, pots and pans overboard, so that nothing could be construed as having been a weapon against us. Um, we made sure everything was ship tight and then at about 4 p.m., I think I have to. Um, I use my hands and so, um, so we're sitting in the boat about 4 p.m. out in the middle of the sea. You can't see land, nothing. And then so we're going, we're going that way. And then all of a sudden, almost out of nowhere, we get one massive warship appeared. So it didn't approach. It just came into view like in one second. One there, one there, and one flanking us. All at the same time. Suddenly. And then we heard the um, radio communication um, starting to come through to our boat. And then we realized it was all on. So big warships. I've never seen I've never seen one in my life. Here we are our little boat. They sent out 13 unarmed civilian women. They sent out three big warships and three little Zodiac boats, which are smaller sort of armed boats that go fast. That was intimidating. It was a little bit intimidating, <coughs> I have to say. And so I think that was at about 40 miles off, maybe, something like that. And I just thought, what is this? Like really though, what is this? It's a, sh it's a show of power. Um, it's a flex of the muscles and it's violence. Whether they use them or not, it's a violent act. 
Um, so we carried on. The communications and the negotiations continued. Please divert your course. No, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, we will accompany you into Gaza, but we can't let you in there without the boats. No, thank you. I'm very polite and we're very calm. Okay. Um, would you like to come on our boat? No, thank you. So the negotiations went on for about an hour, I think. And then, uh, okay, well, we're going to have to get on your boat. Uh, if you have to, but we're just going to keep moving. So they sent the Zodiacs up, and we even, um, we had decided, I think this is quite important, we had had one on that among ourselves uh, regularly to agree, to come to an agreement of our response to Israeli military power. And before we even uh, left our own countries, we had had to sign a declaration uh, of a commitment to non-violence, a commitment to um, peace and non-violence in our actions. And, but on the boat, we again uh, got into a little bit more detail over that, and we decided. So we were also informed by um, previous women who had already done this and knew a lot more than most of us that um, the in Israel, uh, you uh, what do you call it? It's um, compulsory to serve. Yeah. Um, and so we had also heard that we were probably going to be faced with some very young <coughs> Israeli uh, young people who were there regardless, because they had to, and we also were told about those few who had gone to jail um, for refusing to serve. Um, one is serving, I think, two years. <coughs> one young woman is serving two years currently. So um, uh, our vote leaders and Moira Maguire and Anne Wright, who have done this before, they. Um, brought us face to face with what we might expect. And then we decided that we would meet this show of violence with absolute non-violence. And that we would also humanize these soldiers. And that we would model what we expected of them and of the world. And that we would do what we could to uh, not invite any further harm to us or to them. So we came to that decision together and it felt right. So when the Zodiacs brought, I think, um, 20 something soldiers next to our boat, um, our captain was amazing. She did all the negoti negotiating on the radio. She slowed the boat down. Uh, so she, she kept the boat at a speed where the, where the Zodiac could board safely because that was the, the, the last thing that we could um, agree to. Um, they weren't going to let us go to Gaza, they weren't going to uh, go away um, and so that was our final choice. So we let them board, um, they came on board and you know, I looked at these soldiers, young, young people, young men and women thought, because I have, I have three older children and three younger ones, and I thought, you just look like babies. They, were, they had some of the older ones who were their leaders, of course, but the most part, they were so young, and I just thought, you just, I could tuck you into bed. You just look like, I, I could just not separate looking at them um, and, and being a mother. I just couldn't. And I... And I thought to myself, where do you get to? What point do you get to when you do get to that point? When you're seeing in front of you someone who isn't human? What the hell is going on? Um, which is why important it is important that women in particular have a leading voice against all forms of oppression and violence around the world. And um, so they came on, the toxic their tactics had changed. They learnt a little bit. They didn't. They weren't dressed in the normal full black um, face covered um, AK rifles. They were dressed in baseball caps, um, and they weren't. Their uh, arms weren't visible, 
It was a whole different thing. Now, I want to acknowledge um, from the get-go that we were treated completely differently to how they treat Palestinians. We were privileged. Um, we, they knew that they had an inter there was an international spotlight on us, that everyone was watching, that we were um, mostly women leaders um, from all of our communities. We, had, we all had a profile. So they knew that. So they dealt with us um, in a whole different way that would keep, their, that would keep them safe. Uh, I was grateful for it on a personal level. We were taken against our will to Port Ashdod, which was a whole nother, like, six hours of sailing from the time we were intercepted. And we got into Port Ashdod at uh, about midnight, which was very much planned by them. They wanted no one to be around. They hushed us straight off the boat into a covered marquee so that no one could see us, and they processed us through there. Um, at the moment, unemployment in Gaza is over 42% and climbing. For young people, it's well over 50%. They have no control over um, making a life and living for themselves. They are barred from fishing. Um, they are kept within like three kilometers off the shore. Um, 160 plus thousand tamariki are suffering from trauma and do not have access to the specialist services that they need. Um, they have limited access to fresh water. It's only a couple of hours, uh, maybe one or two times a week. And um, they have limited access to power. Again, it's only um, intermittent. That's just the real surface of some of the situation and hardship that they're facing today. That's real surface quick snapshot. Um, Israel needs to stop occupying Palestinian land and Israel needs to lift the blockade. And I'm really clear about that. I want enduring peace for both Israel and Palestine. And that will not come from oppressing Palestine and it will not come from uh, keeping the blockade in place. Some of the most fantastic conversations I had were with Jewish and Israeli women who were part of our campaign, who live in Israel and Jordan um, and Jerusalem, and who, who are very strong to stand up to say, what Israel does is not in my name, and who understand that the lands, the, the sacred, <coughs> ancient lands of Israel and Palestine belong to so many groups of people and have a special place for so many communities and faiths historically and they have to share and they have to work that out somehow. I'm clear that we need to support the grassroots leadership from both Israel and Palestine who really truly do want enduring peace solutions for those lands. I was warned to see the thousands of Israel and Palestinian women who marched for peace just very recently together and then camped outside Netanyahu's residence mansion. I think around the world there are the, there will be those grassroots, community-driven groups, particularly with women leading them who are being undermined and overlooked um, and are not getting their support or their attention and that every outside military and violent intervention that pretends it is wanting to achieve peace is actually undoing all of the work that those true peace and justice warriors are trying to do who know, how to, who know what needs done because they are there living it um, they are the ones who have to pay the impact and the price and see firsthand both what is happening but what is needed. They understand that it is long-term enduring peaceful solutions that require justice. Um, but all of our uh, foreign invasion tactics and violence tactics in particular, 
they undermine that work. I'm really lost as to how we can um, give those groups more support, but we have to. The peace work has to be locally led and empowered, and the peace work has to be supported, truly supported to reaching peace, instead of um, what we particularly have been hearing about today, um, a fake peace solution, which involves violence um, for the agenda of capitalism, for the agenda of gaining more stuff. And um, so I don't know how we do that, but we have to find that grassroots leadership. We have to find those leaders. Um, and there will be women in all of those communities who are doing this work. I now have a role for the rest of my life to keep telling this story. Um, since, we've, since I got home, the women and children have continued to send us their thanks and appreciation. They want us to keep trying. They want us to keep challenging the blockade. They want us to keep doing what we can to raise a spotlight where um, every effort is being made uh, to stub out what is happening there. They don't want anybody to know about it. The, I have never faced so much personal attacks and backlash and criticism in my whole life put together from being part of that trip. And I have done some stuff. Um, but I have never faced such a vicious, vitriolic, sustained and organised trolling attack in an attempt to discredit me and to put me off doing what I need to be doing and to stop me from talking. And I think that's what I'm still recovering from. The seasickness, the going to jail, that, I knew that, that was part of it. And it was nothing compared to what the women and children of Palestine have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. The little bit in comparison, the little bit of criticism and trolling that I have faced as a result of this is still nothing in comparison to what the Palestinian women and children have to face. So if I'm having a hard time and still recovering from that, I have no idea how Palestinian women and children have to live with that hatred on a daily basis. And there are Israeli Jews who truly do love. And they are the ones who we need to find also and work with, who truly do see a better future, an enduring peace with their Palestinian neighbours. And um, this trip was my honour. Um, I'm just tired. <laughs> I think there's more the tears. But um, I have a job for the rest of my life to tell this story at every opportunity, and I will not stop. All that the um, trolling has done has made me realise how this has affected people all around the world and how people have been silenced all around the world. And right, I'll just finish up shortly, um, told me that um, in America, the, the lobbyists who want to maintain Israel violent, Israel violent power go and camp out in the, the American politician's office and will not leave until they have heard their threat that they will damage their political career for the rest of their lives. And it has made me understand how much of an impact this silencing tactic has had around the world. And I need to keep talking, and so do you, because that is dangerous. That silencing makes me fearful. Um, I'm, not, I'm not fearful for how it, how it has affected me. I'm fearful for what my old daughters had to see some of it. I am fearful about the silencing. I am fearful about how many other people it has silenced. That scares me. Because of that, I won't stop talking. And I won't stop telling this story.